All right, good morning. My name's Jeff, lead pastor here at Christ United. If you've been around for any length of time, you know what's next. You ready? If God has been good to you and good to Willow and good to those kids who are up here, let's give him what he deserves, right? Right. Love it. Awesome. Man, what a beautiful sight. It's getting more and more like a standing ovation, right? We're getting there, man. We're getting there. All right, so, so here's the deal. Um, we are getting ready to talk about what Willow just began. Here Willow is saying, I've decided to follow Jesus. And she said, anybody can say yes to him at any time. You know what the amazing truth we learned out of chapter 15 of the book of Acts from David. It's been a while back when he brought us this truth. But that is that that invitation to follow Jesus is given not because we got good enough or not because we deserve it. It's given by his grace and by His grace, He calls people that nobody would expect to have that invitation to be a part of the adventure of following Him. He's walking along and Jesus sees Matthew, a tax collector that everybody would think is just worthless and sinful and no good. And He says, come and follow me. And He turns that Matthew into one of His apostles and He writes one of the Gospels. It's amazing. He says to Paul, whose life we're really looking at right now, He says to him, as Paul is on his way to persecute Christians, to put him in jail, already oversaw the death of one of the best Christ followers. And God grabs hold of his heart and says, you're going to follow me too. Now, here's the thing is that what Willow may have a little concept of at nine years old, I hope before you get out of here, you're going to have a much bigger understanding. And that is that that baby is getting ready to set out on a journey, on an adventure that is incomprehensibly awesome. When she talked about, I love to go to Family Kingdom and water parks and all that kind of do cool stuff with my family, she has no idea what cool is yet. Because what she's getting ready to experience as she goes forward in her Christian life is an adventure. And I want to say that if you haven't lived that adventure, you're not living a Christian life. If you're living just cultural Christianity and you have somehow feel a little bit bored in what you're experiencing, then you're not experiencing what God intended you to experience. I want to tell you what he intends for us to experience. A good example is found, I'm holding a book and maybe y'all can see that book. Um, it's written by one of our own, Kel Steiner. And we are so blessed that Kel and Kristen are a part of our church, right? Right? Um, and, and Kel's book is called Adventures in Saying Yes to God because he's lived out a life, living out that adventure like all of us are intended to do. And this is about his life. And so one of the guys who wrote um, kind of like a forward to this is John Dawson, who was the, the um, president of YWAM at one point. And he wrote this. He said, concerning Kel's life, he said, what an adventure, what a life. Wouldn't you love for that to be when somebody thinks about your life or hears about your life or reads about your life, they would say, man, what an adventure, what a life. How many people here want to live life not in the mediocrity of cultural Christianity, but you want to live a life like the apostles lived, like we're reading about in the book of Acts. In your C group this past week, we asked the question, does God intend to do miracles today like he did then? The answer is what? Yes. Does God intend us to live out the adventure exactly like those guys did with the same passion, the same risk, the same rewards, the same excitement, the same passion? And if he does, what do you say? Yes. Yes. And so we know that God is calling us to something far bigger than what people actually live. The adventure I remember when I was in seminary and we read about people like we, we studied all of the characters of the Bible and we studied about people like Kel Steiner, or people who have been missionaries and experienced great things. And then I'm signing up for a class and I see a class that says backpacking and I'm going like, that's my kind of adventure, right? Because I get to, I get to go backpacking and get seminary credit for it, y'all. And for a guy who hates to read, that was awesome. They actually had a book on backpacking we had to read. But anyway, it was like, so we go on this backpacking. But what I did not realize was that this backpacking adventure was actually the thing that I would probably learn the most from out of my entire seminary experience. It's for this reason. 
is that the backpacking adventure was intended by God and intended by our professors and the folks who were putting it up to actually be a little micro picture of what it is like to truly follow Christ and what that adventure is like. And what we learned in the process was, is that, man, we went to the Red River Gorge in Kentucky. Anybody ever been to the Red River Gorge? Oh, if you've missed it, man, it's phenomenal, right? Phenomenal place. Y'all, there are natural bridges. There are waterfalls that will blow your mind. There are spots in there that feel like you're walking into the Garden of Eden. There are vistas where you look out over just miles and miles and miles of wilderness and mountains. It's just phenomenal place. It's also a very dangerous place. Now, in the Red River Gorge, when you enter it, there's a sign that says, a dangerous place. And it says, there's all kinds of great adventure and fun and great things that people experience here year after year and live to tell about it. But recently, people have not lived to tell about it because they've died in the process of visiting this place. And you see, people who don't know what they're doing in the Red River Gorge, you can walk around a corner following a path that you think is going somewhere but goes off the edge of a cliff. It's like you suddenly begin to realize that, wait a minute, this is an extremely dangerous place. And so whenever, whenever you're living that adventure, there's so much beauty and so much passion and so much joy. There were pools and streams that we would just soak in. We'd take showers under waterfalls. It was phenomenal. And there's also really exciting stuff. And, and there's also really big risk in the the process. So we needed somebody who had been there before us. So we had people that we would follow in that adventure and they had been there. They knew where to go and where not to go. Our first time in the, into the, to the wilderness, they let us go one night kind of doing it a little bit like we thought we should. And so as a seminary student, I was so smart. And everybody else, everybody else is setting up their tents in these really rough places on roots and all that kind of stuff. I saw the perfect place. It was just like little pebbles and sand, and it was perfectly flat. Took out our tent. Myself and my bud, the smartest guys in the group, set up the tent there, not realizing it was a riverbed, (laughs) right? Literally, literally a riverbed. That night a storm hit, y'all, and b- before you knew it, we were literally 10 inches deep in water in our tent. It washed our tent down. And here's the thing I realized, I need somebody to walk ahead of me. I need somebody who's already been here. And then we realized in the process that we needed people to walk beside us. We needed people who would, who, who would just help us because there are many times you need somebody to help you up because you had fallen down or help get you up over an obstacle that you couldn't get over on your own and you would help each other. You needed that. And then later we learned this, that we would all have and all need somebody that was behind us. Not just somebody ahead of us and somebody beside us, but we need somebody behind us because we were going to take high school students through that process. And we were going to lead them. So after we went for a week, we went back and took high school students through, through it for a week. And you know what? That's been nearly 30 years ago. And today there are still people going to the Red River Gorge because of what I learned that I passed on to somebody who passed on to somebody. And they're still visiting amazing places and having awesome adventures. Isn't it a cool illustration of of what it is to follow Jesus because if you're going to be following Jesus in the adventure I promise you can live cultural Christianity you don't need a soul if you want to live the way that most people think that Christian life is lived then you can do it on a golf course you can do it without any intentional relationships you can see people at church and say hi great God bless you but if you're actually going to live the adventure of following radically Jesus Christ like the book of Acts records, then you're going to need a few key relationships. So listen to this. They're found in the book of Acts chapter 15, verse 36 through 16, 5. So if you've got your Bible, turn there now. Grab Acts chapter 15, and, and, and it's the latter part of that, verse 36. Now Steve had talked last week um, about the, the finishing of I think it was last week, I'm losing track of time, but, but the finishing of the first missionary journey of Paul and they completed everything they were said to do. And a while back, David had done a great job of preaching Acts chapter 15, the first part where we learn about what the gospel really is and what the message they were really taking and what they would go back and tell people they really needed to do. And we learned that, that they were telling folks, look, this is about the grace of God inviting you to the adventure of being in a relationship with God and following him. And it's not about a bunch of rules that you have to keep up with, but it's about a relationship that you're going to walk in. And then as we see this relationship getting ready to be walked in for a second journey, 
They're getting ready to go out again for an adventure and a journey. Here's what happens. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. And then Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, along with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. It says he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And then it says Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. And it says that the believers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. And then it says, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. These guys are getting ready to launch in. They're launching into this adventure, and it's going to be just like the one before, and you're going to see so many powerful things happen. It's going to be risky. It's going to be exciting, and the churches are going to be strengthened, and people's lives are going to be changed, and people are going to be hearing the gospel that they're being invited into a relationship with God for the adventure of following Jesus. It's going to be awesome. But did you notice that whenever they're getting out on this adventure, there are actually three relationships that they needed, three relationships that they needed in order to live out this adventure. And they're the same three relationships, they're the same three relationships that you're going to need if you're going to live out the adventure of being a follower of Jesus. It's just like those three relationships that we need when we were in the Red River Gorge. You're going to need this. Number one, there are three people that you need with you. Now get that, with you. You need people not just that you know, but people who have an intentionality about living out life with you. You need that, and first thing you need is this. You need a Paul, someone walking in front of you. You need somebody who's been down the road ahead of you, that knows the obstacles, knows the challenges, knows how to. And listen, the, the person ahead of you, the person ahead of me in the Red River Gorge was not somebody who was, was perfect. It wasn't somebody who got it right every time. But it's somebody that I can learn from their mistakes, right? And people learn from my mistakes. You need a Paul like that in front of you. You also need a Silas, someone walking beside you. You're going to need people to encourage you and help you. And then you're going to need a Timothy, someone walking behind you. You're going to need to pass this on to others who can follow. So let's jump in. First is this. You need a Paul, someone walking in front of you. There are so many verses we could use, but 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 is perfect. Paul writing to the Corinthians, which is a church that he would actually establish and, and would visit uh, that region on this journey, and then later would write to them in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You need, please tune in, tune in, tune in. You need a believer in your life, at least one, but hopefully more than one, who you could look at and say, I want to follow their example because I see they're following the example of Christ. You need that in your life. I was talking to a gentleman this week, and he was talking about living it out, following Jesus. He's lived the adventure, and he took me back to when he was a kid, and he said there was a man in the town that I grew up in. He was the blacksmith, and he said as the blacksmith, he was, had these big rugged hands, and he was just this hoss of a man who hammered out steel into all kinds of things. He said he, he was just a man's man, he said, but he had the most gentle heart and the most loving heart, and he loved to worship God. In fact, he led our choir, and he said, I looked at him, and I thought, that's the kind of man I want to be. Have you got that in your life? As a woman, do you have a woman you look at and say, I want to follow her example because she's following the example of Christ. If you've got a man, if you're a man who says, I want to follow his example because he's following the example of Christ. You need a solace, someone walking beside you. I want you to understand this important truth. Paul wrote to the Ephesians later in Ephesians 5, 11. He said, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. Paul knew you're going to need that encourager in your life. 
You're also going to need somebody to help you. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, their friend can help them up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. So just like those backpackers, we needed some people with us to help us. In the same way, as a follower of Christ, you need people, not people that you just go to church, you're around, you know them by name, but they never know when you're really struggling. You need some people walking with you who are going to help you when you're struggling, who are going to pick you up when you fall. Agreed? You need a solace in your life. And then you're going to need a Timothy, someone walking behind you. And this piece is so important because when you think about Timothy, you know, Paul wanted to bring Timothy along, and he did, and it was beautiful. Um, And he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's awesome. But so many of us think that's the end of it. I find somebody that's setting an example. I follow them. I walk with some other brothers and sisters. But you forget that there are others that need to learn too. There are others that you need to say, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And you, if you never get there, hear this. If you never get to that point, you would miss the whole purpose for you still being on earth. Otherwise, God could just take you to heaven and you'd be finished. Your reason for remaining here is to help others. We talk about unconnected friends. Sometimes there are people who don't know God at all, and I want to introduce them to Jesus and to the gospel. And then I want to help them learn to follow Jesus. Others are people who are already people who believe in Jesus, but they don't have anybody to walk with. They're not connected. But you need to be the person who says, I need a Timothy in my life. I need a a, a sister or a brother. And listen, they don't have to be physically younger than you. The person who was a Paul in my life was younger than me. And yet I followed his example. So you look for a Timothy. You look for somebody who's younger in the faith, not by age. And you help them walk with you. You're going to need that. Now, I want to I point out that Paul, though he said, follow my example to Timothy, it wasn't too long. Timothy was still a young man when he wrote this in 1 Timothy 4.12. He said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. You set an example. So I don't care how old you are. God is calling you, no matter, how, no matter how young you are physically, he's saying, don't you let anybody look down on you because you're young. You need to be setting an example. You need to be able to say like Paul did, follow my example. I'm following the example of Christ, right? You need that relationship in your life or you're going to miss the adventure. Now, the question becomes this. How do you get relationships like these? Tune in because if you don't have these relationships, I promise you're not in the adventure. But you need them. You desperately need them. How do you get them? Number one is this. Number one is you have to choose them. You have to choose people intentionally to be a part of your life. Y'all remember that you're, we're told that in verse uh, it's 38, that, um, that Paul, no, it's actually verse 40, but Paul chose Silas. Paul chose Silas. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask somebody to do this adventure with me. Have you asked somebody to do the adventure with you? Have you said, man, I want somebody to walk with me and us to pick each other up and encourage each other? If you haven't, you need to. You need to choose. It's an intentionality. People think it's all supposed to just kind of happen. It doesn't. You don't don't have a great marriage because one day it just kind of happened. You made a choice and you invested in that choice, right? So number one, you choose. Number two is this, is that you need to commit to them. First you choose them, then you commit to them. That whole process of committing and saying, I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, you know, I'm going to do this. Um, you're, you're choosing people. You're saying, hey, man, I see something in you. I'd like, to, I'd like to follow your example. I want you to be a Paul in my life. Or you're looking at people like Barnabas's and Silas's and you're saying, hey, I choose a relationship. I would love to live out this life with you. But then if you do that, you need to be committed to them, right? Paul chose Silas. And he committed to him. Paul also chose Timothy. You need to look at somebody that you see that has promise. The way that that, um, Brent Richardson taught us in our training, which was so good, is you look for fat C's. 
And fat C's are, are people who are faithful, available, teachable, and have a little bit of courage. That's what Paul did. He saw this young man that was faithful, available, and teachable and had a little courage. And he said, I want to bring you along. Come on. you got to choose them. But then you got to commit. And you got to say, I'm all in, man. I'm all in. Whether that's the Paul in your life or the Barnabas in your life or the Silas in your life or the Timothy in your life, whether they're walking ahead of you, beside you, or behind you, you've got to be committed to be together. Now, you know what? In our current age, if somebody asks a question like, you mean you want me to get up every single Saturday morning at 6 o'clock? No way. That's too big of an ask, right? Have you noticed verse it's verse 4 of chapter 16. I want you to just peek in at verse 4 of chapter 16 if you've got your Bible. I want to ask you, what was Timothy's level of commitment? First thing that Paul did was circumcise Timothy. How many people go like, that's a pretty big ask, right? That's pretty big. I already know that the council at Jerusalem had said it didn't have to be done according to the law, right? I mean, we aren't doing it by the law. But Paul's just saying to Timothy, Timothy, given the context, it's going to be wise for you to be circumcised. And, and Timothy's at a place of saying, look, man, I'm committed. I'm all in. And circumcision, the beautiful thing about circumcision, it was an outward and visible sign of something that said, look, I'm all in forever. This isn't a short-term thing for me. I'm committed. Are you committed? I had a brother, and he gave me permission to share this with you today, but, but he had kind of like Mark, kind of like abandoned the journey with a, a C group I'm in, and, and he, he decided to come back. But when he was with us yesterday, he said this. He said, you know, this week I was tempted to write and say, I'll try to be there, or I might be there. And he said, and I realized that try and might are words that never lead to anything great. He said, I realized I had to be committed. I had to say, I'm going to be there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So here's the thing. Is God saying to you, he's saying, you got to choose relationships, but then you got to be committed to those relationships if you intend to grow in them. And then finally is this, is, is you need to continue with them. You need to continue in those relationships. Like what happened with, with Mark as, as he abandons them and doesn't continue with them in the work. How many people here have done that before? I've said I'm going to be a part of and then things get busy or things get hard or things get difficult and pretty soon I've abandoned it. Now what I love about my brother and he gave me permission to share it was that although he had abandoned the journey, he said, I've got to recommit to that journey. I want to ask you, are you going to commit to staying in there? If you're going to commit to staying in relationships that matter with your Paul, with your Barnabases and Silases who are with you, or with the Timothys who are behind you, then you're going to have to do a few things that are real important. Number one, you have to anticipate conflict. I want you to understand anticipating conflict is so important because so many Christians think that if the relationships are right, there's not going to be any conflict. You know what I'm saying? And how many people know that's just not true? The most perfect people together as a team that was ever assembled were the apostles that Jesus, the Son of God, chose, and there was conflict among those apostles, right? And the truth is, is that even the dream team for going out and reaching the world, which was Paul and Barnabas, y'all remember what we heard in verse uh, 39? It says that they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company, man. And so, it, anticipate conflict. Just understand if the relationships are good, there's still going to be conflict. How many people here know it's true? Every meaningful relationship that you've ever had that sustained, there was conflict. But you work through the conflict. You go through the difficulties and you're committed to being with each other through the difficulties. So anticipate conflict. And there are so many verses that Paul writes about doing stuff like not letting the sun go down while you're still angry. He wrote that to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.26. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it's a pretty powerful statement, but he said, we're not unaware of the devil's schemes. That's why we forgive, because the enemy wants to divide us, and we anticipate there's going to be some conflict. So anticipate conflict. Next is offer forgiveness. Offering forgiveness is so important. Uh, Paul went on and write, wrote to those Ephesians. He said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. If you want to have relationships that matter, you're going to have to be committed to forgiveness. Jesus said, 
not just seven times, but 77 times or 70 times seven. He said, if seven times in a day your brother or sister sins against you and comes back and says, I repent, you forgive them. we got to have forgiveness. Anybody, anybody agree with that? And that forgiveness is what keeps us loving each other and growing with each other. we got to have the forgiveness in our lives. i got to have that, that willingness to forgive. But then here's the other one. I need to not just be offering forgiveness, but I need to be seeking forgiveness. And this is an important point. I um, heard an expression one time that says that most reconciliations break down because both parties come willing to forgive, but neither willing to be forgiven. Y'all think that through. Both parties come ready to forgive, but not ready to be forgiven. Because how many people know this to be a reality? When there's conflict between you and another person, especially between you and another believer, you always have this feeling that I was right and they were wrong. And every conversation you have surrounding it with whoever you talk with, you're hoping that others will see and affirm that they were wrong, those other people, and that you were right. Is there anybody who can be honest enough to admit that that's what we do, right? And you know what's so cool about this conflict? Is you got a conflict that arises between Saul and Barnabas. And guess what? Nobody is said to be at fault. And nobody is said to be innocent. There's no way that it comes around and says, well, it was really all Barnabas' fault. Or it was really all Paul's fault. It was really all Mark's fault. None of that is said in the process because how many people know this to be the reality? we got one enemy, the devil, and we all get monkeyed up in the process. And we all do things for which we need forgiveness, right? And so there's almost never a conflict between you and another human being when there's not a need for you to offer forgiveness, but also almost never a time when you don't need to be willing to be forgiven to actually seek forgiveness from others. So that Ephesians 4.32 where he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Oh, I've got so much to be forgiven for. Anybody besides me? And that's in our relationships with the people that we love. I need to be forgiven and I need to offer forgiveness. And that'll work in your marriage. It'll also work in your relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. It'll work in your church relationships. So next is this. We need to be not only willing and ready and seeking forgiveness from others, ready to offer forgiveness to them, but we need to be pursuing reconciliation. And pursuing reconciliation is so important because what they were doing is they're saying, look, because we had some mess between us does not mean that we're not going to be ultimately back together. How many people know that it's a temptation to just give up on relationships when you start having a mess in them, right? Now, what I love about these guys, what they did was this. It was so, so beautiful. But what they did, guys, was, was they didn't stop the mission because of the conflict. There was conflict between Paul and Barnabas and the enemies behind it. And there's there's, there's conflict with Mark in the mix and it's all conflict. And instead of them quitting, how many people do this? When there's conflict, I just quit. Must have been the wrong church because something bad happened. Or I tried a C group and somebody broke a confidence or they hurt my feelings, so I must not be okay with C group. You just stop. You stop whatever the mission was because there was some kind of problem somewhere. These guys didn't stop. In fact, God took what the devil intended for evil to stop the mission. He turned it around and doubled the mission. He sent groups in both directions, right? It was so cool. But that didn't mean that these guys were done with each other. Most people who have studied the Bible have recognized this reality. But here Paul is, and he's in this relationship where he is so upset with Mark that Mark has, I don't know, you don't even need to go with us, right? Mark, you abandoned us, you don't even need to go with us. By the end of Paul's life, he's writing to Timothy, who had been on this journey with him, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, make sure to bring Mark. He's a great help to me in my ministry. By this time in their life, there had been reconciliation and there had been, they they now were partners in ministry again. I just want you to always pursue reconciliation, right? You don't let the conflict stop you from your mission. You keep going, but you always seek reconciliation. And I believe, you know what? We'll all be reconciled one day or whoever won't will be in hell. That's just where it goes, right? And God's saying, be reconciled. It's beautiful. Now, next is this. Where do we do it? 
How do you develop those kinds of relationships? When you hear C group around here, I want you to tell you all that C group does is take the biblical foundation of the life of Jesus and how he built these relationships and how the early church built these relationships. All it does is help you to do that. It helps you to actually have a Paul in your life, somebody who can build into your life and who's, who's walking ahead of you, that they can set an example for you and you learn from their successes and their failures. It helps you to develop relationships with, with Barnabases and, and, and with Silas's, with brothers and sisters that you can walk with and hold each other up. That's what C groups do is help you really develop those on a deeper level. But you have to choose you have to say, yeah, I'm in. You have to commit. You have to say, I'm going to be intentional about it. These are very intentional relationships. And ultimately, they equip you. They equip you to where when they're unconnected friends, again, they may be people who don't know Jesus, and you're going to introduce them to Jesus first. Or they may be people who know Jesus. They just don't know how to follow him. But ultimately, they help you to connect with others and invite them to be a part of this journey too, right? We're all together. The Pauls and the Barnabases and the Silas's beside us and the Timothys behind us, man, it rocks. It rocks. It is the adventure that God created you to live. Stop living mediocre cultural Christianity and start living an adventure. Anybody want to start living an adventure? If you're going to be in that adventure, there are three people. Yeah, yeah, I got one. Now, start living the adventure that God has called you to live. And so I want to just point out a few things. As you leave here today, this is real important. In September, if you are a Christ follower and you don't have these kind of relationships, stop at the C group counter today on your way out. Now, if you think, I might, I might, or I'll try, wasted words. Anybody would say between you and God right now, I will. I will. I'm going to stop. I'm going to learn how to be connected. You don't have to even stop at the counter. Do you know somebody around you in this church or in your life who you say, man, that's what it looks like to follow Jesus? Go to them and say, come on, let's do a C group. You lead. Are you in one? Invite me in. And if you ask three or four or five people and they say, man, I haven't got time, I can't, whatever the case may be, then go to the C group counter and say, find me somebody. If you know a brother or sister around you that you look at and say, man, I would love for your encouragement to be more than just the encouragement when our team loses at basketball. I want what happens between you and me to matter more than us just deciding where we're going to go out the following weekend. I want our relationship to matter, man. So I want to go on an adventure with you. Come on, let's live it together. Anybody want to do that with somebody? If you know somebody like that, say, come on, let's do it together, right? Let's live the adventure, sick of mediocre cultural Christianity. I want to live the adventure that God created me to live. Come on, live it with me. Anybody want to do that with somebody? Do it. And if you're a person who's already got all that yourself, but you've got an unconnected friend and there's no room for you in your C group because your C group's already full, I want you to consider starting one for that unconnected friend and say, come on, let's do it. Let's live it together. This August the 4th workshop huge, huge, huge. How many people have been reading your C group values for over three or six months and been reading? We're all committed to starting new C groups for unconnected friends. Who's read that? What? Let me see. Raise your hand again. All right. Thank you. For everybody who's made that commitment, if there's an unconnected friend that needs one, Come to this August the 4th workshop. You can start a new C group for unconnected friends and stay in the one you're in, but come on, let's start bringing somebody along with us, right? You can text today that 72727, and, and you text that today to C group right now, 72727. You text that, and you can sign up today. And again, commitment. Do you know that what hangs in the balance of this moment, tune in for a second, what hangs in the balance this moment is this, the balance between you living an adventure in relationships that are going to rock your world or you live in mediocre cultural Christianity may hang right now on whether you take an action today or not. Take an action. Stop by the C group counter. Text that number. Get in it. Get in the game, right? Let's live the adventure in the process. Now, I want to point out that when Paul 
was reconciled to Mark. Because we're getting ready to go into a time for some healing and some reconciliation. Because do you know why most people don't live out the adventure? It's because somewhere along the way, nobody likes me. I've asked some people in the group, and, and, and they said they were full or... Or I wanted somebody to be with me, and they stopped coming, and they stopped coming. It made me feel rejection. Or maybe we're in the group together, and they just they started judging me instead of helping me. Or There's all kinds of stuff that goes on in the lives of believers. And so often, it's somebody wounded me or I wounded somebody, and, and, we, and we get monkeyed up, and it takes us out of the fellowship. So many people here have tried, and you've given up in having the relationships like this. And you know today that God's telling you, you need to anticipate conflict. You need to be ready to recognize the fact that I'm going to need to forgive and I'm going to need to be forgiven and I'm going to need to pursue reconciliation if I'm going to have relationships that matter. So picture Paul and Mark. Tune in. Paul and Mark. Mark abandoned them in Pamphylia halfway through the first journey, right? I think that means that Mark wasn't there when Paul got stoned, Right? It's like, wait a minute, I went through some hard stuff, dude, and you were gone. You weren't even there. How many people can see the reconciliation going this way? Mark goes, I was wrong, Paul. And Paul goes, you're right, you were wrong, I forgive you. Or how many people can think, here Mark is, wanting to follow Jesus. He made a mistake, but he's saying, I want to be on the adventure. I want to live it with you. I want to be committed to you. And Paul goes, Nah. I don't trust you. Don't want you with me. How many people can see, can see Paul go into Mark and say, oh, so wrong. I'm so sorry. And Mark going like, well, you're wrong. I forgive you. But you know what that reconciliation really looks like, in my opinion, based on what Scripture tells us about this? That neither one of them thought they were all in the right, and neither one of them thought they were all in the wrong. Can you see the beauty of Mark coming to Paul and saying, man, I'm so sorry. I know you went through so much, and I should have been there for you, and I'm so sorry that I abandoned you and I left. And Paul throws his arms around him and says, dude, you are forgiven, but you need to forgive me. I am so sorry that there you were ready to go with us, and I just pushed you away. I was so wrong. Please forgive me. And watch these two guys coming back together and watch the beauty that blessed them to the end of their lives. 